Check. Can you hear me? Check, check. I hear that go through the speaker now. Yeah. Check, check. All right, do I have to repeat all that? <laughs> <laughs> oh. So um, the Cliff Notes version of everything I just said was, <laughs> as opposed to a, a public forum, we, we administered a survey, right? And um, we received, again, 118 responses from our faculty and staff, 421 responses from our parents and guardians, and 437 responses uh, from our, our students. We have over 1,000 responses. I think that's a pretty good sample size. Um, a and I also shared with you all of the comments that, that folks and, and the feedback um, parents, students, and faculty and staff gave us. And you know, from that, I, I think we have a pretty good sense of where, where um, people are with respect to their, their input into this decision. And, and I was really, I just gotta say, I was really impressed with the responses. There was no stone le left unturned. I think that <laughs> this issue was, was discussed and, and input was shared that covered every angle. Um, so before I, I invite Russ to, to join us and talk a little bit about next steps, I just wanted to see if there were any reactions, thoughts, or you had any questions about the survey, or, or do you feel like you've, you've received enough input from the community to otherwise make an informed decision based on, on you know, what our students, faculty, staff, and parents are, are thinking about, about this challenging matter? I'm just wondering if the community who's watching right now is aware of what the results are. Um, okay, so I shared the results. It, they were they were in the River East for for those folks who haven't read that. Um, <laughs> I would be happy to share those um, with everybody. I can tell you from our our faculty and staff, when asked should masks continue to be required, we had 118 responses from faculty and staff. 48 percent said 48.3 percent said no. 51.7 percent said yes. Um, Next question I asked faculty and staff was if masks become optional, what they would do. 44% um, indicated they would continue to wear a mask. 24% um, indicated they will choose not to wear a mask. And 31% were, were not sure what they would do. I also asked the faculty and staff, should the Portland Public Schools be, continue to be required to provide proof of vaccination or if unvaccinated, a weekly negative test? 41% um, said no. 54% said yes, and um, the rest were, were un, unsure. <coughs> For our parents, we had 421 responses. When asked, should masks continue to be required in the Portland Public Schools? 68% of parents responded no. 31% uh, responded, 31.8% <coughs> responded yes. When asked if masks become optional, what will you ask your child to do? Um, 23% uh, indicated that they will expect their children to wear a mask. 31% indicated um, they will expect their child not to wear a mask. And 214 parents indicated that they will leave the decision up to their child. Um, when parents asked if Portland Public Schools should continue to be required to be vaccinated or provide negative tests, 57% um, of parents said no, 42% of parents said yes. For our students, and, and we surveyed students at Brownstone, the middle school, and the high school. We asked students, should masks continue to be required in the Portland Public Schools? 73% said no, 26% said yes. We asked our students, if masks, becomes, masks become optional, what would they do? 20% uh, indicated that they will wear a mask at all times. 54% of students indicated they will not wear a mask in school and 31% indicated that they will sometimes wear a mask. All right, so if there are no more questions about the survey or community input, I can ask, I'll ask Dylan to un unmute Russ Melmet and I wanna talk to you a little bit about how I would, would like to frame this discussion. So Russ is here tonight. You've gotten to know Russ well. He's the director of, of the Chatham Health District, and, and he has been a, a remarkable resource throughout this, this pandemic. He has been a wealth of information and answers my phone call every time I call him, which is probably at least once a week at this point. So one of the things I, I want to impress upon the board and the, and the entire community is that this isn't pandemic over, back to normal right we are still monitoring this very carefully 
and still, of course, prioritizing the health and safety of our students, faculty, and staff. We re received on February 18th, this is how quick it's happening, updated guidance from the Department of Public Health. I, I shared that with you in an email last Friday and I, I made copies of it again for you tonight. If you go to the third page of that document that I shared with you, you'll see it, it's titled with, an, it says executive summary. And then there are seven questions that communities are asked to consider as they consider whether masks would continue to be required or vaccines would be, continue to be required. Russ and I had a, a conversation today and we both thought that the best way to help us all understand what happens now is to ask these questions and I would invite Russ to sort of lead us in a conversation about the data and the metrics and the contingency plans and how he's thinking about this, this current situation and of course how he's informing our, our ongoing work as we continue to hopefully ride out the end of this pandemic over the coming months. Russ, did I frame that correctly? Yeah, I think so. Great. <laughs> so maybe Russ, if I, if I just ask the question and then you know, we can entertain um, input from the board or otherwise you know, where the question is answerable, let's, let's answer it and then um, go from there. Sure, I mean, I'm not that formal. We can go question by question if somebody wants to chime in with their own questions or comments about anything that is in this doc guidance document or anything I've said. It can be more conversational if you prefer. Either way. All right, well, well let's, let's jump in then. So the first question is, Ross, what, what does available data indicate regarding the community and district prevalence and transmission of COVID-19? <laughs> it seems like a pretty straightforward question, but um, so I'll give you some of the numbers. You know, right now, at least in Portland, we're looking at case rates, average daily case rates of 22 per 100,000. Um, that is in, you know, what has long been considered the red zone by DPH. But I think, you know, those metrics and those thresholds were developed before schools reopened last year. And I think we've come to understand a little bit more about case rates and um, how fraught they can be to look at, especially one year and three months into a vaccine campaign. But um, so that's what the case rates are right now. We've been coming down uh, by 20, 30, 40% every week for the last four weeks. And I expect that to continue. Um, so at least in the next week or two, I expect those numbers to reflect, uh, you know, not being in the red zone anymore, but being at some lower level. One of the problems is people are using at-home tests and not really going to those public test sites anymore. Um, and those at-home tests are not reported into this surveillance system. So the actual burden of COVID-19 isn't particularly clear. <clears throat> um, so, you know, take that, take those numbers with a grain of salt. There's probably quite a bit more COVID-19 out there than we're measuring, um, but also two years into the pandemic. And like I said, a year and three months into the vaccine campaign, you know, I'm not so sure that the goal is to prevent every last case of COVID-19 anymore either. So, but th those are the case rates. Vaccination rates are pretty high in Portland. We're approaching 80% uh, of the entire population having been fully vaccinated, um, which is pretty high. You know, those are good numbers. When Operation Warp Speed was talking about rolling out the vaccine campaign, you know, they initially targeted 70% of the population as being that magic threshold. Um, but of course, that was also when we thought that vaccines might prevent infections and not just prevent severe disease. So uh, we don't have those vaccines, unfortunately. It looked like we had them and then Delta came along and sort of blew that out of the water. So vaccines are okay at preventing some infections, but they're not the magic bullet um, like they were earlier. So, um, but we've got high vaccination rates. So, you know, the risk to individuals uh, or as a population in town of Portland from severe disease you know, hospitalization, fatalities is, is quite low given how high the vaccination rates are. Um, so case rates are coming down. Vaccination rates are pretty high. In terms of uh, vaccine rates by age group in Portland, 12 to 17 year olds, we're almost at 70% of um, 12 to 17 year olds having been fully vaccinated and 45% of five to 11 year olds. So kind of low on the five to 11 year old front. We'd like to see that a little bit higher. But as we also know, um, the younger you get, the less likely you are to suffer from a bad case of COVID-19. Um, so vaccines, pretty high. Case rates uh, coming down and hospitalizations in the state are also 
uh, coming down quite rapidly, just as they went up quite rapidly with Omicron. So that's where we are with cases. And I think it's reasonable to start looking at those numbers and start asking as a community, you know, what level of disease do we find tolerable? What are our goals? What are we trying to prevent? Are we trying to prevent people from getting very sick? Are we trying to prevent every last case? And, you know, what level of interventions will we tolerate to meet, meet that goal? And I think that's really what we're here to talk about. Thank you, Ross. I, th I think we just knocked off questions one through three. I, I <laughs> appreciate that. Um, so let me ask you this, and this is more of a school question, Ross, but uh, you know, certainly you'd be, be welcome to inform us either with your thinking about what you know is happening in other districts or, or your own um, suggestions. What additional planning would you think is necessary to address the needs of our staff and students who may be at risk for adverse health outcomes or living in a home with somebody at, at, at risk? Yeah, well, I think the really good news at this point in the pandemic is we have some pretty good treatments that are available, and we also have some pretty good pre-exposure prophylactic treatments that people, for example, who are moderately to severely immunocompromised and for whom the vaccine may be uh, not thought to be working as well. Um, the one treatment I'm thinking of is a monoclonal antibody called Evushel, and so people who are not responding well to the vaccine or can't get the vaccine or who are at high risk can get this monoclonal antibody treatment. It provides fairly long lasting and fairly robust protection for those individuals. So for anybody who's listening right now and who thinks I myself am high risk or I work or come into the school and I live with somebody who's at high risk, I would encourage those individuals to reach out to their physicians to talk about that. Um, so on the individual side, people have some options available to them. And as a school community, you can also talk about implementing some kind of respiratory protection program for high-risk folks. That would include, um, especially for adults, having a proper fit test done for N95 particulate uh, filtering face pieces. Those are high-level protective masks that uh, towns have been distributing, but not really doing fit testing. Fit testing is a pr process whereby the person takes a number of N95 masks, brings them into a, a an office, and the uh, amount of airflow that escapes around the sides of the mask when they're wearing it while they read a script, for example, and turn their head this way and that, the amount of air that escapes is measured to determine if that mask is a really good fit and if that mask will provide the stated level of protection that the mask provides. Usually that's 95% filtration of all airborne particles. So offering that kind of service to, for example, to mostly it would be adults, and for parents who have children that they are concerned are gonna be in a classroom full of unmasked uh, the children and are worried about either their child getting very sick or their child bringing an infection home, um, they can also speak to that their child's pediatrician about whether or not it's, it's appropriate for that child to wear uh, something like an N95 or a KN95 mask or a KF94. These are masks that have, tip, that have been evaluated and designed for use mostly by adults in industrial settings not really designed for children. So, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to say recommend that, you know, any parent of any child should put an N95 mask on their kid's face and think it's going to be fine. I think they really need to discuss that with their pediatrician and the time is now. Um, but there are options available from treatments to pro pre-exposure prophylactic monoclonal antibodies to higher level masks that might be able to be used by individuals uh, who, if the school district decides to go mask optional, continue to be very concerned about COVID-19. I mean, the other thing that you could talk about in terms of planning is what do you do if you have an outbreak? And how do you determine if that is actually what's going on in your, in your school? You know, what you want to avoid is COVID-19 running through the school population like wildfire. So in terms of answering the first part of the question is what additional planning is, you know, outbreak detection and then additional mitigation strategies you might put in place to bring that outbreak under control. So I think there's two things. There's the school population piece that's these different strategies when you're having an outbreak. And then there's the individual level of uh, precautions that people can take. And in fairness, it's fair to say that, that you and the Department of Public Health are going to continue to monitor all towns in the state and the state at large for outbreaks and spikes. And then you and the Department of Public Health would be advising us in terms of 
how we should proceed, when it might be wise to move from recommending to strongly recommending and potentially to requiring for short periods of time or, or in other situations or high risk activities, the, the wearing of masks. Is that accurate? Yeah, the problem with the surveillance systems that we have in place for at the State Department of Public Health level is, as I said, it's only looking at reported cases to that system. I think it's probably more effective for school districts themselves to monitor cases that are reported to them, both from public health, the public health department and from families using at-home tests. So it's been my experience over the last two years that school districts themselves are more quickly aware of problems uh, with transmission, clusters of cases and potential outbreaks than are the Department of Public Health or Chatham Health District. It, I've been notified by schools themselves of things they thought were problems before we had any inkling of what was going on. So I would recommend to any school district considering going mask optional to consider ways that they will be monitoring reports that come into the district itself from families and looking at are there commonalities in terms of exposures, in terms of classrooms, friend groups, extracurricular activities. Those are the kinds of things I think schools need to consider implementing if they go mask optional, because by the time the State Department of Public Health or Chatham Health District notifies school that there's a problem, it's likely been burning in the school for quite some time. Russ, can you talk a little bit more about that? Like if, if we're seeing transmission case, you know, transmission in our community rising, or if we're seeing uh, re families reporting increase in, in positive tests in, in our schools, um, how, how do we determine, short, you know, because we don't have any metrics from DPH, which I, I, there was talk originally about there being metrics that we could work with, um, but we don't have anything. So. What does this look like in terms of identifying what an active outbreak is? Is there, a, is there a cutoff point? How do we know when it's time to start taking extra steps or putting in extra preventative measures? That's a difficult question to answer because it really depends on what's going on in the community. So these two types of things might work hand in hand. And we might say next month that community transmission is extremely low. And as a school district, you might only be getting reports of one case every other day. You know, if everybody remembers back to last spring that's kind of where it was and i'm crossing my fingers that we're, we're there in short order this this coming spring as well if you're only getting you know one case reported every other day to the school district or a particular school and then in a span of one or two days in one particular grade or in one particular classroom for example you get four cases reported that would be a pretty good indication that this something is going on that is above what is background noise in the community and all the school nurses um, in Portland School District that I've spoken to are aware of when things don't seem right, but there isn't a magic number. It really is, is this dramatically different relative to what we have seen going on um, over the last couple of weeks? Um, some people uh, try to apply metrics to outbreaks and say, for example, if 10% of a class or 10% of a grade uh, has a positive test result in the same week, you would consider that a cluster of cases and that would trigger some investigation where you're interviewing all those individuals and asking about community exposures. And if they're not reporting any community exposures, then that looks like in-school transmission. You might define that as an outbreak of disease as opposed to an unrelated cluster of cases. But those metrics are just really difficult to pin down because percentages of students in a classroom or a class or a grade really can be very dependent, again, on what's happening in the community. So that would just be part of a conversation that I would expect to happen between the local health department and the school nurse about what's going on in the classroom. And I think that gets us to the, the last question in terms of advanced contingency planning, right? I mean, the, the reality is, and, and Ross can correct me if I'm wrong on this. We have a pretty good playbook, right? I mean, we've been doing this for two years and, and you know, if God forbid we ever had to go to remote, we would be prepared to do that. If we ever needed for, and I don't think we ever would, we should be clear about that, go back to hybrid or cohort or masking. Mm -hmm. we, we know how to do all those things. So, you know, we, we have a, a playbook and Ross is available to us at all times, both in his capacity as 
implementing orders from the State Department of Public Health and advising us if things were happening at a more local level. <coughs> would, that, would that be accurate to say, Russ, you're on speed dial? <coughs> yeah, this, this, is, this sounds very similar to the way we manage other communicable diseases and not just respiratory viral pathogens, but things like norovirus, you know, gastrointestinal diseases. Um, there, there really is no number above which you consider it an outbreak and, you know, we drop in from Blackhawks on our ropes and shut the school down. It is part of an ongoing conversation about what is happening in the community, what is happening in the school, and what seems out of the ordinary. And also what, what uh, the school will tolerate. There's going to be some transmission. If masks come off, there's likely to be more transmission than we've seen in the past. But I want to acknowledge that there's a lot of uncertainty around that because we've had masks in schools for the last two years. So we really don't know how much transmission we're going to see. So I think it's just, yeah, we were, I'm available. Uh, Charles has my phone number and we, we have been and will continue to be in regular communication about what is ongoing in the school, what is ongoing in the community. I just want to say that's exactly what we heard this morning with the DPH. They talked about the inaccuracy of their metrics and everybody's looking at metrics and hoping that, that the data is accurate. It's not. And again, we don't have home test scores uh, or, or test results to know, but I think that would be, should be a requirement if you're home testing and you get a positive, call the school and let somebody know. And I think that could be added to our um, toolbox of knowing what what's actually going on and what's happening around us. Um, and basically I heard local rather than looking at metrics for regions or for the state. And um, I, I think you're spot on with what you're saying in terms of the only question I have is, are we ready to take our masks off? Would, would the end of March be better than, than the end of February? And how, how is that setting with you in terms of guidance for what schools do in the next month? Uh, well, I'll talk to you about my my personal comfort level with the risk associated with removing masks, along with just about you know most other school districts in the state. Um, I prefer a wait and see approach because there will be plenty of early adopters, and we will find out in probably a few weeks how that goes. Um, that's where my head is at with regards to going mask optional, we simply don't know what is going to happen. We can look at like portions of the Southern United States, which went mask optional all throughout the Omicron variant, but that was at the peak of the wave. And we saw a lot of transmission in schools across the South. We saw some schools during the peak end up having to shut down because they had too many absences from mostly staff and many students as well. But it's not a great corollary because they also weren't doing many of the other mitigation strategies we're doing here. Um, testing uh, during the peak was really difficult across the South as it was here, but we were masked up here. So to me, my, if you're trying to pin down a recommendation for me, it would be to wait to see what happens with some of the early adopters. But I understand that people are sort of chomping at the bit to remove the masks and Certainly the conversation around what interventions the community is willing to accept and to what benefit, that's why we're talking about this at all. And um, it's just an uncertain time and certainly a difficult time because I can't give you any assurances that I think when the masks come off, everything is going to be fine and we're not going to see transmission in schools. I really just don't know the answer to that question. Tim, any questions? No, I have no. Dave? No. Stacy? I just have a comment. I mean, I think one of the things that we saw, I work in community health care, so we were consistently wearing masks. And throughout the month of January, we were just inundated with outbreak. And it didn't, it, it, the masking and, or non-masking, it didn't matter. Um, with Omicron, it, it affected our staffing. 
So it, you know, we had this month of, you know, every week it was just shifting and, and all of that. So um, it is uncertain. Um, I don't know necessarily what waiting, I, I, I get it, you wait to see, but something else can pop up too, so just a comment. <coughs> Sure, and I, I, I don't disagree. You know, we saw so much transmission during the peak of the Omicron wave. It was very difficult to determine chains of transmission during that wave, whether people were exposed at work or at home or in some other social setting. Um, it became extremely difficult to even tell. And contact tracing at the community level and in many businesses broke down because the volume of cases was too high. You just couldn't reach everybody you needed to, to have those in-depth conversations to even try to figure it out. Uh, and the other thing that we did see with Omicron is those loose fitting cloth face coverings. Uh, you know, the CDC a number of months ago started recommending that people consider higher level masks at that point because it was found that they were preventing some transmission, but certainly not as much as they were during Delta or Alpha or the original strain of the virus. So I, I, I get where you're, where you're coming from and it is, you know, I can't sit here and tell you that you know, masks were the thing that made the difference in schools or anywhere else um, that didn't see transmission um, because there were so many other factors at the time and continue to be that really difficult. Any questions for it? No. I, I just, thank you. I, I have to, well, I'm all set. Somebody else, you gonna go? She said she didn't have any questions. I know. I, I don't have any. No, I do have one, though. I just, if go I can go. But I, I would let Lauren. She cool. said she's, she's good. Oh, okay. It's all, it's all you, <laughs> I just <laughs> we'll trip over ourselves. It's all right. Um, it I, I just, this has to do with the CIAC uh, guidance. It, I think they get that right, right? That's the sports. Uh, mm -hmm. And the day, they're, they're coming out um, with guidance now that says it, masking won't be necessary, I think for basketball and like indoor track. Is that correct? Do I? That's correct. And then districts with mask policies, would, would that still be required or does that the guidance from the CIAC kind of take precedence over that? Like if they're gonna go down to John Little, to Floyd Little, Floyd Little in New Haven for a tra indoor track meet. Is that? Well, I think you're uh, you're bound by whatever policies are in place in the building you're occupying, entering, playing, whatever. Okay. Yeah. So that would be my guess is that if you're sending people to a school district to compete in an athletic competition in which they are continuing to require masks, that your student athletes would be required to wear masks. And Thank also you. riding That's on the school buses. Um, the math requirement is a federal law which has not been repealed. So kids getting on a school bus need a mask. That's correct. It's a public, considered public transit. And so the, right now the federal uh, rule on public transit is that everybody is required to wear masks regardless of vaccination status. That's it for me, thank you. I have a, I have a question actually. Um, so we were talking a little bit earlier about the difference in vaccination rates between our um, 12 through 17 age bracket, the, the middle school and high school students, and our, our elementary students. Um, and I guess, Russ, I'm just curious, I mean, I understand, I mean, Charles, we've, we've discussed this, that this would be, so present a, a pretty significant administrative challenge, but I'm, I'm curious your perspective, are, you know, would you recommend, are there districts that are exploring the idea of different policies for different age brackets based on overall vaccination rates? Is it how much of a concern is that difference in vaccination rate to you personally as you look to evaluate that? Um, I know that there are some districts that are looking at applying metrics to their mask policies that include both community transmission rates and vaccination rates. Um, not in Chatham Health District that I'm aware of, but not everybody's made their decisions. And you know, when it comes to vaccination rates, it's a pretty good indicator of whether or not somebody compared to somebody who's unvaccinated, whether they're at higher risk for getting severe disease. But I think what we know about very young children is with very few exceptions, 
they do fairly well when it comes to COVID-19, but there are some unknown long-term consequences of COVID-19. We're starting to hear reports about cardiac events. So there's a lot that we just don't know about COVID-19, especially COVID-19 in children over the long run. And I think it would be uh, really difficult looking at the vaccination rates you know, being as, as low as they are. And I can share with you that they've remained fairly stable over the last several weeks. We haven't really seen much of a change. Um, to try to make a differential, take a differential approach based on vaccinations that is only, especially because um, what we know about vac the vaccines we have available to us is that they're really good at preventing severe disease. They're not as great at preventing transmission. Um, balance that against young children you know, being uh, faring fairly well when they get infected with COVID-19, even if they're unvaccinated. And it's a really, you know, I don't really have a clear recommendation for you when it comes to young children and vaccines and using those as thresholds below which you would continue to require masks and above which you would say, we're okay. Uh, I think it's a fair, it's a fine conversation to have, but it's a really difficult one. Oh, any um, thoughts about differentiating between vaccination availability? Because the really young kids who can't, aren't eligible to get a vaccine, is that something that we should be considering? Right, so children under five right now can't be vaccinated. Um, I will share that the WHO for quite a long time has not recommended that children under six years old be required to wear masks. Um, and that's the case in many parts of the world, including many parts of Europe. You know, the United States is the only country that I'm aware of, major developed country anyway, that requires children um, above two, or recommends that children above two wear masks in K through 12 settings and daycares and things like that. So I, I just, I, I have a hard time really strongly recommending that for children under six, you require everybody to wear a mask and, daycares and pre-K and things like that. Uh, the WHO is pretty emphatic that that not be recommended. I tend to not like to go against CDC's recommendations, but that's one I particularly have a hard time with myself. Thank you. WHO does not differentiate between, uh, you know, based on vaccination status, they, they don't say when vaccines become available or, or not. They just say children under six should not be required to wear masks. Of course they can if they want, that's per WHO. also share that we saw with Omicron, even with universal masking in many pre-K and many daycare settings, outbreaks of, of COVID-19 where just about everybody in a daycare would get COVID-19. So when children are that young and they're wearing loose fitting cloth face coverings and they're not wearing them particularly well and they're sort of all over each other, they're, they're engaging in behaviors that make mask wearing sort of that neutralize the effectiveness of even a well-worn face mask, it becomes really difficult to control COVID-19 in, in places where children that young are, are congregating with how transmissible Omicron is. Anybody else have any questions for us? So I, I would just add one thing, and th this is more of a administrative thing for the schools than, than, than something that Russ can necessarily advise on. but. While he's here, maybe he would, would like to chime in. The, qu the question asks, um, what are we going to do to support staff and students who wish to continue wearing masks, right? So again, the way I see this evening playing out is, is if, if the, the policies on the agenda tonight are, are stayed, are, are rescinded, then it would, would become optional, right? But the option exists to wear masks, right? And you know, as Russ mentioned too, and I can tell you, we have a closets chock full of masks and, and face shields and, and at home tests. We have a lot of, of tools. If, if the policies are pulled back tonight, I, we have a full day of professional development with the faculty tomorrow. Um, at eight o'clock, I will be standing in front of the, the faculty explaining the, the board's decision and how we're going forward. And I am very much prepared to work with the principals and the teachers to make sure that 
faculty, staff, and students who choose to continue to wear masks are made to feel comfortable in that decision, right? And students who choose not to wear masks are made to feel comfortable in that decision as well. Um, I don't know how that's gonna play out. I'm going to be completely honest with you. I've, I've never been through this before. None of us have. <laughs> but one of the things I know our teachers are experts at is creating positive classroom and school climates. Right? And we will recommit ourselves to doing that to support all students and and recognize and, and respect the health care decisions that they make for themselves and, and the families expect them to make. Um, Russ, I don't know if you have any insight into that. You have, you know, any, any how we make people feel comfortable if they choose to or not to wear a mask, except to say that it is very much on, on our radar. Well, the, <laughs> the easiest way to make children, especially children, feel comfortable wearing masks is with the trusted adults around them wearing masks. So, but I, I understand based on your survey results and perhaps the policy decision that you're going to make that, that that's not going to happen universally. Um, so I think, you know, any educator out there and parent out there knows that modeling the behavior that you want your children to engage in and feel comfortable doing is the best way to make them feel comfortable doing that behavior. You know, otherwise I think, you know, get creative with, um, you know, messaging to families and messaging to your students, just like schools have gotten really creative with anti-bullying campaigns. Uh, I think there are a lot of creative educators that will come up with some really great ways to, to make children feel comfortable and, some really great administrators that are going to figure out ways to make their um, faculty and other staff feel comfortable. But I don't really have any great, you know, revolutionary ideas for you. Um, be ready to intervene if you notice bullying. I mean, I just think <clears throat> children are really good at recognizing differences among one another and pointing out those differences sometimes in unfriendly ways. So being prepared to have to add, you know, mask bullying to the long list of things that you don't want children to engage in, and coming up with creative solutions for that is something I, I encourage you to, to look towards. So, so I have a question: What other strategies do the school nurses have? In ter or should know in terms of what are the other what are the what are the remaining mitigation uh, processes that we are going to continue to use you know I, I've heard you know um, test and stay I don't know if that's still valid um, we went from six feet to three feet um, are we going to um, still require that um, hand washing obviously was always should have always been a universal precaution for infection um, quarantining, um, coming back with a mask. Uh, you know, I've read some of the CDC and some of the DPH requirements from November. Um, if you were sick and you came back to school after the five or eight days or whatever, you had to wear a mask for another four or five. Are those, what, are, what, are, what is remaining of all the things that, that we um, have in our toolbox that we will continue to use? Because I think that's important to know as well. Um, well, Charles and I have had this conversation already, <clears throat> and I've strongly recommended that the schools continue to engage or go back to contact tracing, not an exclusionary, not a policy of excluding students who are identified as close contacts. But when there is a case of COVID-19, doing a case investigation, identifying the close contacts and giving very specific messaging to the families of those students, including your student has been identified as a close contact of a case of COVID-19. We're sending your student home with an at-home test kit. We recommend that you use this, you know, on day five or after and let us know if your child tests positive. And we strongly encourage your child to come back to school on day six if they're feeling well um, or to continue to wear a mask during the entirety of what would have been their, their period of quarantine previously. And for people who test positive for COVID-19, um, making sure that a policy of keeping them out of school while they're sick with COVID-19 for at least five days continues. And if they come back on day six or after, having those students or staff wear masks. 
know, that to me is very basic. Um, the, the contact tracing, the case investigation and contact tracing, I strongly recommend only because that's the best way you're going to find out if going mask optional is presenting a problem from an in-school transmission perspective. If you're not doing any contact tracing, the only way you're going to identify a problem is when it really smacks you in the face, like half the students in a classroom go out because they're sick or test positive. So doing contact tracing, but again, not excluding close contacts as we were before, but just letting them know specifically you were a close contact, encouraging testing, and making sure that those students and staff that test positive continue to follow the isolation guidelines as outlined by CDC and DPH, which right now include wearing a mask when they come back on day six or afterwards, if they're feeling better. And that's the, yeah, that's really helpful because parents will think the mask is going away, so is everything else, and it's really not. All we're doing is removing a mask at this point. Yeah, I find it, you know, there's this principle in public health that is, that goes something like this, you know, you should use the least restrictive means possible um, to reach your goal, to achieve your public health goal. To me, I think masks are the least restrictive means, but I understand they seem to have become a symbol of pandemic restrictions in some sense. And so there are many people who feel like requiring masks is the most restrictive thing you can ever have. To me, excluding children from school is the most restrictive thing you can do, um, which is why you know I'm recommending masks for people who are identified as close contacts, masks for people who are sick with COVID-19 and come back on day six through 10, um, and really strongly encouraging testing. Now, those three things, I think, um, minimally are something I would strongly recommend that you consider if masks become optional. We have not been contact tracing for the last bunch of weeks. Is this, I'm, I'm curious if you're on board, if you think our, our nursing staff is on board with beginning a case investigation process again, especially as our case rates are dropping so much and it would be less of a burden than it would have been over the last few weeks. So I'll be, I, I, I just had this conversation with Russ today. I, I have not had a chance to speak with the nurses mm -hmm. yet. I will. I completely agree with Russ that I would say the non-exclusionary contact tracing. Yeah. Uh, Russ and I agree that quarantining healthy students as a function of a school nurse's prerogative is, is not where we want to be. A and also we have to recognize that when we were a few weeks ago having many, many, many dozens of cases in every school every day, it was <coughs> simply impossible for our nurses oh, yeah. to do that. Mm -hmm. right. Now, that said, I, I am confident that our nurses are, are able to contact trace as a function of our schools are relatively small. We know where kids are supposed to be and our parents have been really good about notifying us of positive cases. Does it have to be the full investigation that our nurses were spending 48 hours over a Saturday and Sunday doing? Probably not. So I, I, I think in working with Russ to design a, a protocol that isn't as rigorous as the contact tracing that we were doing um, at the beginning of this thing is, is, is certainly doable. But again, I want to have conversations with Russ and the nurses about that. But I, I think that this, I don't know if I would call it soft contact tracing or, you know, um, I don't know what we'll call it, Russ. Some but of it. Light. <laughs> right. You know, you can, there are other things that you can start with. For example, contact tracing in the higher risk type of settings, like lunch, um, choir, you know, indoor physical education where people are running around and, and those kinds of things and see if you detect transmission in those higher risk settings. You know, if the answer is no, or you do contact tracing universally in the school, again, non-exclusionary, but, you know, rigorous type of case investigation, contact tracing, and you don't see transmission then that is something that you could discontinue comfortably. I think my, my recommendation to reintroduce contact tracing is simply because we're uncertain how things are going to go. But if, you know, look, case rates are as high as they're going to be hopefully through the end of the year. If you do contact tracing for every case for the next month and you don't see transmission, um, then I would feel comfortable saying, you know, dial that back. But really, this would be a short-term type of intervention that could go away. And 
that's really all. But again, there are different ways you could do it. High risk settings only, um, younger grades only where this type of social distancing is more difficult because they're sort of all over each other. And there are different things that we could discuss. And like Charles said, we could talk about this offline, but um, it doesn't have to be the full blown every case everywhere contact tracing and certainly no exclusionary policy because that's not happening right now. I think it also gives us a chance to develop a metric and, and get some historical data based on what we're seeing right now on the ground so that we, we could be creating our own um, um, data bank, if you will, with that information. Oh, that's a lot. Charles, can I ask you just a quick logistics question? Um, because we know that the, the Town, um, our, our first selectman has issued a statement that town buildings will no longer require masks as of March 1st. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a statement in that document, which we discussed in our policy committee meeting, that unvaccinated folks um, who are unable to maintain uh, adequate social distancing of three feet are required to wear masks mm -hmm. in town facilities. So can I ask how that impacts our schools? Right, so that's, a, that's an interesting question. I, I spoke with Ryan Curley about that, and, and I did say some, it was likely that people were going to make the connection between the town requirement and the fact that, that our schools are municipal buildings. Um, it's, a, it's Ryan's opinion, and, and I will clarify that with him one more time tomorrow, that, that the schools would operate under the parameters that you establish and not necessarily the parameters that he and the Board of Selectmen establish. That's, that's correct. That's, we heard somebody question that today, and, um, and, and they are Board of Ed juris jurisdiction. Thank you. Uh, Charles, I would just ask you, how do you feel right now about where we are and if, if we were to rescind these policies today, do uh, you feel like you have in place what you need to move forward? I, I do. You know, I, I, we have a lot more tools now than, than ever before. You know, we have boxes upon boxes of masks and tests. You know, we, we have two years worth of, of understanding and, and we have highly tuned in and engaged nurses and teachers and principals. And, and I have a hotline to Russ and to anybody who I needed it and we would, we're nimble enough that, that we could respond in real time if there was any kind of cluster or super spreader event. And I'm also confident that we're not telling people they can't wear masks. If, if, if folks, and I will wear a mask. When you, when you see me in the buildings, I will have a mask on, and, and, and that's what I will choose to do. And, and that's what we're saying here, is that at, at this point, if you need a mask, we will have one for you. KN95 or, or one like I'm wearing now, surgical. If you ever have a concern, we have test kits for you. So I, I think we have the tools that we need, and I think we're nimble enough to respond quickly enough that if by the, the, the end of the first week of March things were looking bad or if there were a spike or if Russ were calling me and saying, Charles, th there are issues here, that, that you know, we could respond effectively. So I, I, think, I think, you know, I'm very anxious saying this, I would be lying, I think all of us are, and that's what makes this such a, 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 a difficult decision, but I, I think we're ready to um, repeal the policies. Now, that said, we have, since the beginning of the pandemic, deferred to recommendations from the Department of Public Health and the Connecticut State Department of Education. I think we are being consistent with that. And if we were to keep these, then we would be going above the recommendations from the Department of Public Health and the Connecticut State Department of Education. I say that because I have an EDD after my name, not MD, not MPH, I'm not an epidemiologist. We have to defer to the experts. And if the experts are telling us the language is recommend, not require, I think that's, the rec that's what we we need to do. Where they recommend, we recommend. Where they strongly recommend, we strongly recommend. Where they require, we require. But to go beyond that, I think, takes us out of our lane. Yep. Yeah. That's 
how it's been handled since day one in town. So that makes sense. Yep. Right. Well, I would make a motion that <coughs> we um, rescind policy 4118.237 effective 228 at midnight 1201. <laughs> I'll second. Okay, that was Laurel seconding. Lauren. 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 <laughs> Lauren. <laughs> that twice tonight. My apologies. And I have a question because <coughs> the recommendation was to repeal, to to um, not repeal. What did what you say? Suspend. Um, suspend. suspend the policy, not to rescind it. Rescind it takes away, removes it. There's nothing left of the masking policy at all. Should we have to reinstitute a masking policy in a universal way? Um, I'd like to see it repealed and then revised on the recommendations of Kate. So that's my question, is why would we want to get rid of the policy altogether? I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Isn't it easy to bring it back, though? And isn't the state telling it's us the state could mandate masks at any time? Right. That's true. They, they can. And, and so by us rescinding this, we take away anything, any of the guidelines that, that we would be using um, because we have the authority to also um, put that back in place. I don't, it's up to you. I, my understanding from, le from the legal authorities that I uh, got today, or legal information I got today, was that repealing it would be better than rescinding it. Did our Re attorney Suspending it rather suspending than it, rescinding right. it. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Did our she, attorney have any feedback on that sort of thing? Um, so the, the only advice that we, we got from, Kate, from Shipman and Goodwin was to identify the policies that exert local authority. They, I didn't get from them the, the verb uh, repeal, rescind, you know, um, suspend, you know, amend in any way. They, they simply said identify them. And, you know, I'm, I'm, Meg, at first I'm here, I haven't, you know, I'm not, I, know you know, I don't know the legal nuances know, of the difference between either. repeal, rescind, stay, suspend. execute, you know, that right. effect, you yeah. know, remove, yeah. you know, yeah. that, that I know. type of thing. I, I understand. I, I think what, what I, what, as I hear the motion, this would, would pull the policy. Now, with that said, policy committee meets regularly we could add a new policy at, at any time mm -hmm. um, I just I, I, I don't know I don't know about the verbiage but to be clear removal of this policy whether it's you suspended or rescinded or whatever regardless of the policy the information that came out from DPH and State Department of Ed gives school districts in consultation with public health officials the ability to implement masks as needed with or without a, a, a masking policy requiring it right we, we still have the authority as needed per our other policies that are in place to protect the public health of our students okay. to put masks into play temporarily if they're needed correct i'm not a legal authority so i can't answer that well, that was to charles that was to charles so yes. so what, what what's interesting to me on that mm -hmm. is one of the reasons Russ is here, and he can correct me if I'm wrong, Russ, as, as the district health director, has the ability to shut down a restaurant if they're serving bacteria-laced food. Right? He, he, as our, our health district director, has plenty of statutory authority that, that likely, if, if ever necessary, we could lean into for, for guidance and advice as our public health director, and if Russ was uncertain, certainly he has an immediate connection to the State Department of Public Health, right? I'm confident that as part of our all hazards plan, we enjoy great leverage <coughs> with actions we need to take to keep students safe. Right? And certainly in consultation with Russ, if any type of emergency ever presented itself, whether it was a tuberculosis outbreak or meningitis or lice or <laughs> any of the other things, we would respond proactively to keep right. students safe. And we would have the authority and ability to do that. And we don't have a policy that says if you have lice, you have to keep your kid home Correct. X days. Right. right. And, and much of it, I imagine, would be <coughs> common sense and, and to the extent that common sense doesn't prevail, force of authority. Right. Um, but, you know, again, nobody wants tuberculosis, meningitis, or lice. Yeah. So. People are willing to do what they need to do to prevent themselves and their children from getting those things. And I, I think that, that what Russ will tell you is that's where we're headed. We're headed back to the days, Russ, correct me if I'm wrong, of regular proactive 
careful monitoring for all matter of, of disease transmission, of which COVID is also one. Uh, yeah, I think what remains to be seen is how susceptible our student population is to COVID-19 moving forward. You know, we saw a lot of infections with Omicron. We do, you know, at least in the 12 to 17 year olds and above have a high level of, of vaccinations. So I think it remains to be seen if when, if and when we start to see transmission in schools when masks come off, if it will be very limited, you know, chains of transmission or clusters in one particular place, but not spreading all around the school, or if we will see, you know, widespread sustained transmission in schools. Um, I think what we're all hoping to see is something very limited and for which interventions can be very targeted. So I'm thinking by the classroom, you have a cluster or an outbreak in a particular classroom, the least restrictive way to bring an outbreak under control may be to require all the kids in classroom X to wear masks for the next two weeks until it's brought under control as opposed to quarantining the classroom, which is more restrictive than a brief and focused period during which everybody in that class or cohort or whatever wears a mask. So that's where I think, you know, my head is at in terms of managing COVID-19 in a school, just as it would be for other things like, you know, norovirus or lice, you know, doing things like knit checks. You might not do them everywhere in the school when you have two kids that have lice. You might just do it in that classroom where the kids are playing and touching heads together and spreading lice. You wouldn't necessarily say we're gonna do this across the entire school. So that's where I'm thinking the interventions will go, very targeted at first. So whatever flexibility you need from a policy perspective to implement recommendations from public health to bring on a, an outbreak under control is what I recommend you have in place. Um, if that means the Board of Ed has to have a policy that's written out that allows the superintendent or this principal or the nurse to require masks in a particular classroom, you know, then you have to consider those policies would be my recommendation. But that, that's where I'm thinking. Very focused until what we do seems to not be working in that regard. So I move the question. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. Motion passes. <clears throat> Next is the uh, policy requiring vaccinations. Policy 4118.239. I would make a motion that we rescind policy 4118.239. There's a second? All second. Lauren? Can I just mm -hmm. clarify, since we didn't really, we talked a lot about masks, but we didn't talk about this policy much at all. Mm -hmm. The policy committee had a, a robust conversation around this policy, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, Charles, it, the mandate covering vaccination requirements uh, and or testing and lula vaccination expired on the 16th, correct, correct? Yes. Um, of this month. And it is, there's a little bit of a gray zone about whether our, you know, individual districts have the legal authority to continue requiring employees to be vaccinated or to provide testing. Um, and so our, our discussion at the policy level was that, um, was that this was not, not necessarily a road we wanted to go down and that we thought it was best to rescind that policy and be done with it. Did I cover it, Meg? Anything you want to add? No. Not at all. No. Any other thoughts or conversation? If not, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, that one's unanimous. So both policies are rescinded as of Today? 12.01 on February 28th. 28th, okay. All right, no other.
other business to come before the board tonight. Is there a motion to adjourn? The move we adjourn. Tim, is there a second? A second. Thank you, Russ. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Russ. All in favor? Yep. Anytime. Let the good fight continue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say it's unanimous. <laughs> <laughs>